Today we are going to discuss the outlook on the global trading system um, given the current um, and recent uh, economic and financial turmoil. Um, we will have a discussion and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience um, and including our online audience, um, both in person and online. Um, Uh, one of the, the largest kind of growth impacts that we can measure in globalization is the enormous expansion in the share of global product which is traded across borders. Um, it's something we can measure. Uh, in 1990, 18% of everything produced in the world was traded across borders. By 2006, it was nearly 30%. Um, we have never seen uh, either such high levels nor such rapid increases in uh, the share of um, uh, in global trade at any time in the past. Moreover, um, the character of that trade has also changed over this period, um, <coughs> both in the kinds of goods which a country like the United States trades um, uh, has moved up increasingly intellectual IP intensive, we might say, um, or high end or high technology goods. We have large new actors uh, in this system. In 1990, uh, China and India were both negligible um, uh, participants in global trade. Um, really, they virtually didn't, um, they, uh, virtually didn't register, and they certainly didn't register with respect to trade with, with Europe and the United States. Today, um, as everyone knows, they are major actors in global trade, particularly China. Um, so uh, a great deal has changed. One of the consequences of this vast expansion uh, in, of the global trading system is that a global recession uh, has an enormous impact on trade. Um, and so we saw, in fact, that as this crisis worsened, um, we were seeing declines in trade um, that uh, rivaled the declines we saw after uh, Smoot-Hawley was passed in the 1930s. That is, this enormous expansion of globalization gets you the effects of protectionism without actual protection in this precipitous drop in global trade. So the first question um, that um, I thought we would discuss is what is the, what do we see as the potential impact of this crisis on the global trading system? Um, what have we learned and how should we rethink the way we approach trade questions given, um, uh, given this new trade landscape? Uh, <clears throat> that's a very good question, Robert. Um, and incidentally, thanks for all the overly generous remarks you made about me. Uh, I hope I, I managed to live up to even a <laughs> fraction of what you said. Um, <clears throat> certainly, trade has, in the last 20, 30 years, practically everywhere, expanded relative to GNP in virtually every country. Uh, even India and China, as you pointed out, which were laggards, which were sort of giants which were supposed to wake up after the war, but continued snoring until about late 1980s because of very bad inward-looking policies and a variety of uh, associated um, failures in economic policy making. They've finally woken up, and, and part of their waking up has been considerable outward orientation, even more so on the part of China than India. And you see that they too have now wound up being major players in world trade and they will, now I, I think the, at the same time what has happened, and one, one reason why trade has expanded very rapidly is not just that we have been dismantling trade barriers, which we have. So with any given uh, set of fundamentals, if you lower trade barriers, you're going to get more trade, obviously, relative to, to GNP, there'll be a multiplier effect. 
but uh, it's not just the expansion or the reduction of trade barriers, but we've also seen internationalization of production uh, in a massive way, what are called supply chain effects. And remember, the trade to GNP, which is what we were talking about, it divides trade, which is a gross value, by GNP, which is value added. So if the same item goes, it's like a car, goes to you, you put on a battery in your country, then it goes to another country where you put on you know, uh, a bumper, uh, another place where you put on windshield wipers. Each time <laughs> the components, the, the bulk of the car is being counted as trade, right? When it goes from one country to another. But the actual value added, the, the words GNP, is not really going up that much. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you would expect a, a very substantial disproportionate effect. Now, this is not a, simply a statistical illusion. It does reflect, in fact, good economics. I mean, people are doing this because it adds value to, the, to, to, to what they're doing. And I think this is extremely important. Actually, later on, we might discuss how bilateral agreements are being, you know, are multiplying now and when we discuss Doha and the multilateral system. Because under the bilateral system, I have to decide who, which, which is, I mean, which product is coming from where before I can give you a preferential treatment. Now, at a time when people are bringing in things from everywhere, uh, like the bionic man, you know, it's just his brain which has you know, not been replaced, uh, when everything consists of parts from everywhere, it is a mug's game to try and say, look, I'll give you a better terms than someone else. And this is why people are now more into multilateral trading system than into the bilateral. So I think that has been part of it. The reason also why uh, I think trade, in reverse, of course, you would see, therefore, it's just as trade was expanding rapidly relative to income, you would expect in the downturn the thing to, to, to fall disproportionately. But one additional reason is that this is not just a macroeconomic crisis. It's also a financial crisis. Mm -hmm. It's a double crisis. It's interactive. So the decline of trade credits also has been an important factor. So I would say that that accounts for the very substantial downturn. Uh, it's not that protectionism is broken out. We'll have to be discussing that. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think there's much evidence of um, protectionism having broken out. I mean, we, we naturally make a lot of noise about it. Because if we don't, the politicians will take the easy way out. Uh, so like if you fear a tsunami coming, you better start screaming like hell, even though the wind is just blowing more roughly. Uh, and the tsunami is still far away. And I think what uh, one additional reason why protectionism has not been that bad so far and is because precisely because of the internationalization of the world economy. Today, uh, you take Buy America provisions, the president had to worry about it, but the president has been rather lukewarm about going, going and batting for, for trade for a variety of reasons. But the people who went to him were, in fact, the manufacturing and other lobbies, because today, Everybody has world markets. In every state in this country, there are firms which are actually into trade. So Boeing can go, and I'm told did go to the president and you know, to his advisors and said, if you do something like this, India can easily turn around and take some orders on Boeing to Airbus. Uh, GE can lose uh, the two nuclear reactors which the <laughs> Indians have set aside for us Americans and they can take them to France and to, uh, and to Russia. Caterpillar would lose. Uh, these are just the prominent examples of what can happen. So that has been a stabilizer, I think, mm -hmm. to some extent, in our, in our leadership, uh, no matter how pushed by the recession into import competing measures, into being a little more moderate. And therefore, protectionism has been held at bay by the nature of the global economy today. The, um, uh, this globalization, as you point out, um, reflects global production systems. Right. And the global production systems have been driven by vast increases in foreign direct investment. Right. Is there any evidence, and this is not something we discussed before, just the, the question just occurred to me as you were speaking. 
Is there any evidence that the financial crisis is having any um, uh, significant effect on flows of foreign direct investment? Nothing very dramatic, I would say, no. Um, because remember, it's, it's been on about three years at maximum, mm -hmm. two years of intensity. Mm -hmm. We're already showing green shoots. So I think uh, that's one reason. And the other reason, of course, is that while, as you pointed out earlier, you know, now everybody's in the same boat. But in the old days, when the US went down, we mm -hmm. used to say uh, that when the US has a cold, the rest of the world gets influenza or pneumonia. Well, today, when we get a cold, uh, we have India and China, which are spending from the reserves uh, and which are holding up the world economy. Actually, we have a, uh, a stabilizing mechanism rather than uh, a, a mechanism where we bring them down. Mm. They are actually helping shore us up. And so I think that has been a, a, a dramatic change. And I think this is what makes many people feel that maybe these two countries, uh, which have really emerged finally as, as substantial powers, China a bit more mm -hmm. so, but, uh, uh, that they will begin to play a major role. And their views about how to run the world economy and the global system is going to play increasingly greater roles. Now, Brazil is in, in that sort mm -hmm. of ballpark, more or less. Uh, uh, and there's no other country that, I mean, Russia is still in deep, deep trouble. Right. We all know that. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, I mean, Russia has the same problem as India had, which is of having such bad policies for such a long time that, mm -hmm. you know, we in, in India are also in the middle of still cleaning up. I mean, it's not like we've gone over to a new model completely. I mean, it's like cleaning up after a tsunami. The, the, your job is almost never done. And you go to Russia, which I did you know, three months ago with the St. Petersburg Forum, and I could not get uh, <laughs> my traveler's checks cashed anywhere. Into, and I was trying to get them into uh, basically uh, the rubles, which anybody who, who lacks foreign exchange should be jumping at. We went through 25 banks. None of them would ever do it uh, because they said we'll have to consult Moscow and it will take about six weeks and so on and so forth. So this is what I mean. They're, they're very different from where they were, but they're still far away from where we are. And so I think this is why uh, I would not put Russia mm. quite in the same league, uh, but Brazil certainly is, a made, is moving up. Well, the largest player in Latin America, but still... Still small. S still very small. Still small. And India, small too, player. I think will be another 15, right. 20 years before right. it surmounts it. But China is very much there. This yes. is why the president talks of G2 and so on, uh, which is a bit of an exaggeration to some extent. But I think it's uh, certainly China's views do, do matter, and that's largely because they're holding a whole lot of treasuries, and this scares the pants off the Americans. Well, you know, trade, uh, trade negotiations for the last half century have really largely been negotiations between the United States, the large European economies, and Japan. Right. Um, uh, with the entry of China into that, certainly into that realm uh, right. of importance to the global trading system, and the <coughs> prospective entry of India, right, and the ability, if not Brazil, then the ability of Brazil to organize other Latin American That's true. economies that is uh, true. Um, into a block. Does this, what kind of, what are the particular challenges and, and issues that this will raise for the global, uh, for the trading, for the negotiating process for well, you, you see that uh, in relation to, let's, let's talk of the Doha round, mm. because that is a matter of, I mean, that's where these powers are making their impact felt on the shape of the Doha round and whether we can negotiate them, a conclusion to it. Uh, because the US position is extremely constrained. Uh, the president is unable to move even in his G20 statement, which, is, which was just released today, there's hardly a mention of trade at all. Uh, that's because the Democrats 
are deeply influenced and constrained by the unions. Uh, and I'm a pro-union guy. I told John Sweeney once I'd never crossed a picket line in my life. And although he's Irish, he, does, he doesn't have the sense of humor which you know, <laughs> we, the two of us, have. And so I said, and it wasn't because I never encountered a picket line. <laughs> I mean, I have encountered a picket line, I'm 75 many times, <laughs> but I've never crossed one. I mean, my generation never did that. But uh, the unions are extraordinarily fearful of trade with the poor countries, and they feel that the stagnation of the last 25 years in workers' wages is due to trade with the, with the, with the poor countries. Now, if you believe that, and I don't think it's correct, uh, and you know, there's plenty of work, empirical work. I'm not doing armchair theorizing, but I'm doing armchair talking right now. Uh, I think what you have is a situation where they're so worried, we could always take them on in public argument. But last election, they managed to get a whole lot of people elected you know, into the Congress who are indebted to them for that point of view and have to buy into that point of view, whether they genuinely believe it or not. So as I say sometimes, the unions now are not interested in arguing anything at all because they have the political power. They've substituted financial capital for, for human capital because they spent a lot of money <laughs> electing these guys. And of course, you know, their activism and labor and so on, um, ringing bells. <laughs> so they have both capital and labor on, on their side. So they actually are constraining the president because mm. the president's constituency does include the, the, the working class and then quite naturally. So he's not able to maneuver that and you see that. So he's not able to, he, he has a problem. Even if he wants Doha around settled, he's going to have a problem which is that he, he would be a general without troops mm. because he, if he wanted it, he would not be able to carry the, the right. unions and, the, and his Democrats. I mean, he cannot count on it mm. at all. Uh, two, he's got to have, therefore, the business and other lobbies on his side too. And they might be able to substitute for, for, mm. for these lobbies. But the, they say, look, we don't have enough on the plate. So we are not going to accept this unless we get more. Now, where, Brazil, India, et cetera, and China, et cetera, really are becoming, uh, therefore, a bottleneck to this approach, saying mm. we have to redo Doha, get more concessions before we can get the U.S. Congress to vote on it, which is, which is the USTR position right now. Right. That is something which these other guys don't accept. Now, it's not because I'm coming from a developing country, because I'm schizophrenic. Sometimes I think of me as Indian, sometimes as American. And I, I'm told by my friends that I slip from one hat to the other. <laughs> <laughs> but here I'm putting, on, I'm not trying to put on the Indian hat, but simply saying, if we were to bring in new issues, or rather substantial new concessions, you can forget about it. Because it'll take another five years to settle it all. Mm -hmm. By that time, Doha would be dead as a dodo, in the sense it's been eight years now. People who don't want the multilateral system will say, that's gone, right? So my proposal is, uh, and I think there is something to be said for it, uh, which is that we close with minor adjustments between India and the US on the agricultural side, mm -hmm. uh, which are doable. I mean, you know, we can discuss that. And then say, we don't bring in all the new demands on services, on manufacturers, which as an economist I believe in, right. but, but uh, uh, as a negotiator for Doha, I would say we immediately declare a new round as we close this one and say these are the issues, this are the agenda, and we get the Indians and the Chinese and the Brazilians to agree to that. And then we start negotiating that. So we, if this was the end game, mm. my sympathies are with USTR and with the US. But if it is not the end game, uh, and if we start a new one, which I think we need to, then I think it does make sense. But my worry is that the longer we delay Doha, the more people will become disillusioned that it's just an endless process, will not deliver anything. And today we need this rule of law, because you mentioned the 1930s. And the great benefit from the 1930s was 
that we then wound up, I mean, 1930s were uh, free for all. I mean, it's like watching American style wrestling. There are no rules, right? And everybody was going for each, you know, hitting each, right. each one below the belt. The, the architects of the architecture after the war, uh, from which the GATT came eventually, uh, wanted to build in stumbling blocks of, you know, sort of uh, uh, rules under which you could not just indulge in a free for all. So that's what we call the rule of law was brought in. It is weak, but it's still the rule of law. Now, if we start abandoning, I mean, if, we, if Doha doesn't work out and this disappears, Doha, I mean, the World Trade Organization represents the rule of law, mm -hmm. such as it is. And it is in our own interest, US and all the big players were Brazil, India, China, everybody, that there is a rule of law because you cannot really function unless there are rules. And I, you see right. that. I mean, like even the Chinese tire case that's coming up. That will be, uh, it will be decided under the rule of law because right. we signed with the Chinese uh, at the time of their entry into the WTO and the Chinese signed it that until 2012, we have the ability to use a selective safeguard mechanism. If they didn't want it, they should have said so, right, at that time. So now we, it is part of the law and it is, and the U US government is entitled to use a safeguard action, which is essentially what it amounts to. Uh, I don't think it was wise to put it in, but it is there and I, you know, therefore, if the president says, I'm going to have to, to do this, my sympathies would be with him mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that we do need to worry about the, right. the strength of the whole system. I, um, I sympathize with the president on both things, um, but I certainly recall after the, the Clinton administration was a period of really uh, very notable achievements in trade, right. um, both NAFTA, the Uruguay Your round. Two big battles. And, and then the um, trading status of China right. uh, in 99. Um, uh, certainly the last two were achieved under very Difficult. favorable economic conditions. True. Um, and I, um, uh, I think it would have been very difficult to pass uh, the China uh, legislation Unless. in anything other than a boom. Right. Uh, than an economic boom. And, I agree. Uh, and, you know, President Clinton had great timing in lots I of know. respects, including the timing of when to be president. But this is part uh, of the problem which President, president Obama, Obama does not have such no, good timing. But, but Obama faces also the fact that, <laughs> I mean, historically, it's very difficult in democratic systems to move forward and liberalize trade because a lot of people in the system get risk averse. Uh, and actually, it was funny because when President Obama went to uh, Canada to see uh, Prime Minister Harper, and of course, he was cautious as always, I mean, the, our president, uh, about, about trade. But then Harper was, was sort of expansive, and he said he was even going to liberalize trade, at which point I, I was watching it with my wife, and I turned to her, and I remarked cynically that this, this shows that he, he's made up his mind he's going to lose the election. <laughs> He might as well be a statesman, <laughs> but, but it's really difficult. It's a difficult act, and I, I'm glad you touched on it. So I have one, one little disagreement with President Clinton. I think he was terrific in fighting for uh, Uruguay Round and NAFTA. I mean, he really betted the company, as it were, on the thing, and just barely, almost barely squeaked through. Terrific. Uh, however, uh, at that time, the unions were equally fearful. They led the fight also, and, and uh, you remember. My view is that the president at that time uh, basically confronted the unions and vanquished them. Mm. I, I don't think he, at no stage did he say, uh, all right, Mr. Sweeney, let's have a meeting like this one. Right. And you sit down here, you bring your troops, all, the, all of you who are worried about trade with the poor countries, right. undermining the wages of your workers and so on, which sounds reasonable under certain, you know, I mean, I, 
we economists mm -hmm. can think of several models under which it would be true, but this is a question of which model really applies. And then you, he could have brought me, if he didn't like me, he could have brought Paul Krugman, who at that time was on my side. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This was the free Bush era. Right, right, <laughs> I remember. I remember. <laughs> and there were, every, every economist virtually yeah. had written on the subject. And we could have thrashed it out. And then, I, I, I mean, Sweeney is a reasonable guy. I, I know him pretty well. Uh, and we could have really had a thrash it out. Then they, there is a chance they, they could have been converted mm. to the view that really this is not the, not, not, not the way to handle workers' wages, it's the wrong way. Uh, trade should not be the, but he never did that. So in well, a way I have, I mean, not really, uh, I don't know of any economist who was ever invited in that way to do, to do something like this. Maybe the president did it privately, I have no idea. Um, but to some extent, President Obama's problem is that the unions have never been convinced that trade is not a problem. I mean, and I think, so. President Obama's task is made even more difficult because he's really got to now start right. in a situation like this. So, but maybe I'm wrong on that, but well, this is... Um, I would argue that um, while, the, while the industrial unions make the public case about the potential cost to their workers of, right. of the global trading system, um, it has political salience because of the economic conditions of the rest of the workforce. Why? That if, the, if wages had not been stagnating, um, that message would not have, wouldn't reverberate True. and wouldn't take hold, True. as it didn't in the 1990s. Why? Um, and that the prerequisite for significant expansion of the global trading system is um, uh, rising wages for right, most people. Right, if, in fact, you know, <coughs> we are leading the American people into a globalized economic era, then it's our responsibility or their responsibility to figure out how the vast majority of Americans can prosper in, this, in a globalized economic era. I, I think you touch on a very important point as to I mean, I feel we are now in a, in a different epoch, as it were, mm -hmm. uh, for the working class uh, and, and, and for the economy as a whole. Uh, I think uh, the workers' wages are <coughs> in serious trouble, <coughs> partly because of domestic problems, mm -hmm. like uh, if you look at... Like health care costs. Yeah, and yeah, that, 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 that is true. But I think that's part of the, mm. the, the solution also. Mm. But I think what you have is a situation where uh, you have deep and continuous labor-saving technical change going on in the system. Right. Uh, like if, if you took your grandchild, uh, uh, you know, my grandchild, into uh, seeing modern times and you, you know, where Charlie Chaplin goes bananas mm. on the assembly line, and your grandchild says, you know, take me to see an assembly line. It'd be very hard to find one today. You can find assembly lines, but they're run by robots. Uh, and there are five or 10 people up there in a glass cage who are skilled, who are managing it all. So continuously, you're finding a whole slew of people being displaced. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that is really... <coughs> putting pressure on wages from time to time, you know, and, and continuously. Two, I do, would not exempt international trade altogether, mm -hmm. though, I, which is, and I think what is happening is that today, uh, there's so many suppliers, uh, so many countries which can actually mm -hmm. act in trade. Our multinationals go around. People read the same textbooks in many of the top countries as, as we do. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the, the other day on, on 60 Minutes, there was a, something about India's institutes of technology, which are world-class institutions which we helped build. And it's a Mandarin-style system on, on which, you know, about 5,000 kids are selected who are all hot shots whom Intel and Bill Gates really want around here. Uh, and they were, they were asked, 
you know, what would you do if you didn't get into these, into the IIT in, in the exam? And they said, oh, we would then settle for MIT or Caltech. <laughs> now that's, that's what you're confronted with right now. So given that situation, uh, we, we've got lots of reasons why in Tom Friedman's terminology, the world has gotten a little flatter. Where Tom makes a mistake is in thinking it is flat. Mm. It's not flat. There are so many differences across countries which you know, yeah. one could bore you with, uh, and which many of you are probably familiar with anyway. But that has meant intensified competition. So today, uh, I start a, an activity, a particular, you know, like uh, Airbus had something in, in some part of France, mm -hmm. I think. Suddenly, Boeing gets an advantage. That f factory has to be wound up. So there's volatility. Now, if that factory is to be wound up and you cannot hire and fire freely, then you, can, you will not invest in that country at all. But the, the volatility coming from the fact that the comparative advantages become so thin, the people are neck to neck in virtually everything. There's always somebody breathing down your neck. That is one thing on the international side. Mm -hmm. Then the in internal technical change, then the weakening of the, of the unions for reasons to, which are not related to this. Mm -hmm. Many of them are non-traded sectors which have nothing yeah. to do with trade. Uh, all of that is putting a heavy burden on people. You know, and we have to really figure out how to help people meet that volatility. Because mm -hmm. volatility also means your lifetime earnings also flatten out. Yes. Because in the old days when you were on an assembly line for a, a lifetime, the employers were interested in investing in you because then the returns would also accrue to the firm. But if tomorrow you're not going to be there, you're going to be somewhere else, it doesn't pay you. So, so, so all of these things are, my worry is that we, unless we really address the issue holistically mm -hmm. of, of a globalized system with along with the the nature of technical change. We're not going to be able to get at, you know, how to help mm -hmm. our workers in an effective way. Things like healthcare, of course, are necessary, but that's, that's like sisterhood in a way. I mean, you, you need that, right? I mean. Well, uh, this, is, this is actually an argument that we at NDN and I, right. in my most recent book, have been making that uh, it is the intensification of competition which arises right. out of globalization right. which reduces the pricing leverage of firms right. and consequently makes uh, rising fixed costs such as right. health care right. or energy or pensions cut very directly into job creation and wage it gains. It does, it does. And that this is a new landscape. Given yeah, that, so we are agreed on that. Yeah. yeah. But I think the... Uh, I don't know if you see uh, that reflected in the kind of thinking which you 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 get from the. I, I mean, I've never seen. A, we have not. A this statement, has not permeated a vision yet statement. to either I mean, the institution have, down there or the institution uh, yeah, we have over ed, there. Yeah, ad hoc ed hoc <laughs> right. approaches. Right. But I think what we need is to understand in totality what is the nature of the world economy and the ongoing technological change processes and so on, and then situate yes. what we do for workers, which is the most important thing, uh, and for innovation and so on, in, the con in that context. Right. Because otherwise you're not going to get the full, full blown effect uh, and the case to right. be made for it. Now given, given the political um, difficulties in driving large trade uh, a large trade agenda in the United States, and uh, the economic context, and the complication of having to manage a negotiating process that involved a larger and expanding number of players with cards in the game. Wow. Um, uh, what is your, what's your kind of best case scenario for how we should proceed? What's the the um, um, how do we promote continued liberalization and greater efficiency in the global economic system in the context of all these challenges? Yeah, I, I think the um, this comes up most 
directly in this, in, on issues of governance at the World Trade Organization, for example, uh, because the Bretton Woods institutions, which my students uh, let off more lightly than the WTO for some odd reason, because the it was the WTO uh, meeting in 1999 in, in November, in December. That's where everything hit the fan, as you know. So they, the kids actually think on campus and the NGOs think WTO must be the worst of the international institutions. Actually, from their perspective, it's actually WTO is the most <laughs> It's the most democratic right. to the point where one right. one country can hold up things if it wants to. Yeah. And it's interesting that Russia's entry has been held up. I mean, for those of you who know that, <laughs> or who don't know, by two countries, U.S. and guess which is the other one, Georgia. So Georgia was kind of asking for trouble <laughs> from the <laughs> Russians <laughs> for, to be hiding behind the American umbrella. Didn't make much sense for it, um, but <clears throat> but that's what you can have, but on the other side of the coin, uh, it doesn't really work out so that people hold up, you know, small countries hold up everything and so on and so forth. Actually, because people tend to coalesce into groups, mm -hmm. uh, just the way it would happen, like in a, in a departmental vote <laughs> at Columbia University, people form coalitions, uh, <clears throat> and the thing is not not as chaotic as it looks. Uh, secondly, I think we also have bent, because in the old days, the US had what was called the Quad. So US, European <clears throat> Union, uh, Japan, uh, and Canada. I, I never, Canada must have floated the idea and got in on the act, probably. So that was the Quad. And now already it's changed. <clears throat> and now you have uh, G4, because uh, which is, became G6 in effect, right. uh, and probably is even larger <coughs> now. And now we've got G20 and G8, and I was just telling Robert before the meeting that you have to be G something to be important nowadays. <laughs> and so I'm going to print stationery saying, Jagdish Bhagwari, G1. <laughs> <laughs> As my daughter often, you know, we was in the Marine Corps, said, Daddy, you're a great leader, but you have no followers. <laughs> <laughs> And in Marines, we have, we, we have a different problem. We've got to lead our troops. <laughs> but, but jokes apart. Um, <clears throat> this is, we now have uh, <clears throat> to really already adapted in, in a major way. But we have to make sure that we don't again give the impression that we take only the big boys like Brazil and China and on board. Because the little, countries also feel very upset, and now they're moving in the direction of wanting the UN to intervene, which would be the case of death, in my opinion, for yeah. something like this. The UN has never managed to do it, and UN is too politicized, like the last meeting we had, uh, where the, uh, the foreign minister of uh, <coughs> Nicaragua, who's a, 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 a priest, I think, an American priest, I think, uh, even a Columbia graduate, I'm told, <laughs> like the president. And they produce about the worst document, very populist and anti-capitalism and anti-everything and so on. And the meeting had to be postponed by three weeks to, till it was rewritten and so on. And the next, pre he was the president of the General Assembly. And the, guess where the next president of the General Assembly is coming from? <laughs> Libya. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think it's calculated to to produce the kind of results we would like, you know, after proper negotiations and so on. So I, I don't think, but if we don't actually have the smaller nations feel that, you know, they have something uh, on the overall design. <clears throat> but I don't agree with uh, people who say everybody has to be in on everything, you know. And this is where, uh, I mean, you know how people like Bono and Geldof I mean, they know how to sing, but I don't think they know anything about economics, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. And, you know, I'm making a point about division of labor. Let them sing and let us spend the money, right, which they collect. Uh, Before we... <laughs> appropriate division of labor. But Geldof once wrote saying when G4 were meeting, and it was just a matter of India and U.S. Uh, and to some extent EU uh, and... and uh, 
Japan having to, these were the countries expected to make last minute concessions. Right. So these, this was a meeting of people who were going to give. Africa was not going to give. Africa is just taking, right, in terms of concessions. And Africa already had managed to get a fair number of concessions on one-way entry concessions, right? Because we Americans had also gone along with the EU and Japanese had made some noise in that direction. So they were getting something, but they were not, no one was asking them to do anything by way of making a concession. So it was natural that you would not expect these guys, Africans, to be invited to that specific meeting. It wasn't an overall WTO meeting or anything like that. And Geldof had a fierce letter in the Financial Times saying, this was terribly undemocratic and the Africans should be. And I said, good God, this is why this Zambian woman, Mo 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 Moyo, who has come out mm. you know, with this book on dead aid, <laughs> mm. and she, she, she's even more against these celebrities stand, you know, saying they know something about the subject uh, and trying to you know, gum up the works on everything on the site. So I, I think the governance issue is something we have to really think through. But I think we've got to give the, the, the marginalized nations a little more say. Otherwise, they will gravitate towards the UN, thinking that's where they get more bang for their buck, or at the WTO directly, right? Right. But I think we as leaders, because we are still right. leaders, I mean, you know, maybe there are others who have come up, but the U.S. is still the biggest Rottweiler on the block. Yes. And so it has to really be right. in, a, in, a, in a expansive mode. I mean, this is why I like the President Obama has that. Mm. I mean, he's not someone who's going to wield uh, the axe. I mean, right. at least he well, constitutionally is incapable of doing that and just saying, you have to do this, you have to do that. Well, certainly the United States, I mean, we, and I think we sometimes discount this because we live inside it, the, is by far the disproportionate actor in the global it economy. Is it's very a, much so. 22% um, of global GDP, right. three to four times the size of any other economy. E exactly. And um, the importer of last resort, $2.2 wow. $2 trillion in imports um, a, in 2008. Um, that's greater than the entire GDP of all but four other countries in the world. That's true, that's um, true. So, so the United States really does have a Some unique role. footprint in, I know. I in know. the course of global <clears throat> trade. Right. Um, and um, that brings me to the last question, and that is you have often been a critic of um, regional trade agreements and more bilaterals. And yeah. bilaterals. I was getting to the bilaterals. And, you know, the United States has certainly experimented with a number of bilaterals, um, pursued a number of bilaterals, but with very small economies. Very small, yeah. We are now talking about a bilateral with a, with a very important economy, the Korean economy. Right. Um, how, what are your views on that process? Um, I, I think the U.S. is in a different position from an individual country mm -hmm. like Korea or Singapore or Chile doing it, be precisely because of the last point you were making, that we are so big, we're such a leader, that what we do has a systemic effect. I mean, nobody really in the end cares what Chile is doing. I hope the Chileans present, if any, <coughs> forgive me for saying that. Uh, but it, the point is, it also gives you a freedom to do whatever you want in your own interest. Uh, so if I was thinking of specific countries like Korea, I mean, Korea is the largest so far mm -hmm. among the ones we have yes, transacted with. Yes, we still haven't consummated it, but still, mm -hmm. it, it, it could happen any time. Mm -hmm. uh, there, it seems to me that a country like Korea, for instance, is pushing into it on, on security grounds, mm -hmm. because it has China on the one side, mm -hmm. it has Japan on the other, North Korea to the north. Uh, it is, it wants our embrace. Uh, I asked Lee Kuan Yew uh, mm -hmm. once, why do you, why, why, is it, why is Singapore, which is virtually open, you know, why is it actually going in for a, an FTA with, uh, with US? He said security. Mm. He said we have, we, uh, 
were worried about, well, he said, look at what Japan did in Asia. He said, we are worried about the Chinese. We want a counterweight. We want a counterweight. Yeah. So this is just a precautionary behavior in case the Chinese you know, do something melodramatic, or as against just dramatic. Uh, and so these are the kinds of arguments. So it's the security and broader <laughs> arguments which decide who is going to have a bilateral with you. So, so trade becomes a kind of instrument of foreign policy, as it were. Now, uh, that is, so, so if every policy is in the end foreign policy or right. <laughs> general policy, as right. you know. So we can't carve out something just for right. trade. But I think what it's doing is, is that it, um, when we start doing it, we were among the late ones. This is actually known among economists as the European disease, because yeah. the Europeans who started it in a very big way. And the Europeans have no qualms about, I mean, you know, dealing, dealing with trade in special, uh, in special ways, actually. Uh, virtually, there are only five countries with which European Union has uh, the MFN treatment, meaning the lowest tariff which you're supposed to give. Everybody else in the world with whom they trade has a special deal. So actually, <laughs> the MFN is actually the LFN, the least favored nation clause, because <laughs> everybody else is doing better than MFN clause. Right. Now, the, so I mean, if I was writing on the European Union, I mean, you know, I would, this would become, actually I told Pascal Lamy, he should call, he call who is French, as you yeah. know, uh, and say it should be called the LFN. We are much better, <laughs> much better on this. We've sort of followed suit, as it were. Right. Partly it was because they were doing it, so we thought right. we would line up our own troops a little bit in international negotiations and so on. Though, though you know, we, we should also <laughs> keep in mind that you know, the United States in the 1950s really led the way in unilateral trade right, concessions. Right. But it was part of our foreign policy. We That's didn't right. do it for trade. That's right. It was open to any country that would align itself with us against the Soviet Union. I know. Um, and, and besides, I mean, remember, I mean, there is something to uh, to free trade. I mean, I would like to believe that uh, the statesmen of the world read my writings and therefore, <laughs> therefore, free trade. Um, if I was Jeffrey Sachs, I suppose I would say that. <laughs> right. But, I belong to a generation where we understated, run overstated <laughs> our, our successes. So anyway, so the um, the uh, people, or rather even statesmen, they will actually more easily vote for free trade, which is a Darwinian process where you know our firms compete with other firms and, and so on. It's a Darwinian process where if you expect your firms to win you're more likely to be for freer trade. Mm. If you expect your <laughs> right. to right. lose, uh, you're really not going to be. Now, I have this amateur sociological theory, which is that President Reagan and mm. President Bush Jr., they both believed in America in a totally unnuanced <laughs> way <laughs> that we could poss never possibly lose, uh, whereas Democrats are Miss Stevensonian, too nuanced. They think you can lose. <laughs> it's a matter of, yes. you know, you lose some, you gain some. So I, I think in that sense, these two guys were, you know, with, with all the problems you have of managing your beliefs in the real world, were in fact more committed to freer trade than many Democrats are, and temperamentally. Yet, and yet Ronald Reagan's administration was probably well, the most protectionist it was. in the post-war era. But this era. is why I covered and, the, right, the right. writer, because I think he uh, basically, the dollar was overvalued. So, so the macroeconomics, which you often yes. focus on, does matter. I mean, if, you, if you're overvalued and you're not therefore able to sell and you tend to buy too much, uh, and the continuous bills coming up in Congress, clearly, you know, which are protectionist, he, he was forced, the right. president was forced into not merely throwing crumbs at the, at the protectionist, but actually whole loaves, as he's pointing out. I mean, he gave so much yes. that in fact, de facto, he was yeah. rather, he was very protectionist very in protectionist. effect. And until they changed the exchange rate with the Plaza yes. Agreement, then yeah. the thing eased off in a very big way. Right. 
So I think the bilaterals are not the way for us to go because it also clutters up the system with all kinds of preferences. This is the point I was making earlier. Yes. And two, the bilaterals are used not just for trade, Robert, but uh, and many developing countries are now beginning to get worked up and the NGOs also, which is that when you, when, and this is not about bilaterals among small countries and so on, but where one large power like us or EU is involved, and you've got a little guy, a little country at the other end, it's not just the trade which may be unevenly done, which doesn't mm -hmm. matter to me because trade liberalization is good and unevenness is a political issue. Um, but every lobby gets <clears throat> its you know, finger in the pie and says, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, and so on and so forth. If you look at the uh, NAFTA agreement, for example, I mean, in my debates with Laurie Wallach, I mean, she always brings this heavy thing, and I hope she'll get hernia from carrying it around. <laughs> uh, but I, it's probably a hollow volume, I think, which she <laughs> brings just for effect. And a lot of it is special rules of origin, mm. which, are, which go down by product, incidentally, not just industry leading to a variety, I mean, sometimes you're taking away with the left hand what you've given with the right hand, and nobody knows, it's so, in, I mean, only mm -hmm. lawyers who are paid to work through all that. Right. But more than that, there's so many trade unrelated issues. I mean, I'm not saying they're bad issues, but they're totally not related to trade. Anybody who's managed to lobby USTR gets his lick in. in. So you get a chaotic pattern, and now the developing countries are now beginning to wake up to the downside of doing trade. <clears throat> so if you want to do trade, just go the honest route, work it out at the, because when it comes to one-on-one, -on -one, it's impossible given the nature of politics mm. for even USDR or the president to really keep this process, yes. you know, focus on trade. So many of us feel that this also means that the old idea that you know we would have a whole lot of um, bilaterals, they would all congeal into a, a regional, and the regionals would congeal into the. Um, and so I've called the the bilaterals leading to a spaghetti problem uh, or spaghetti bowl because I can't eat spaghetti without dropping it on my tie. Uh, so it's a it means chaotic rules of origin and different pref different tariff rates depending on whom you're trading with at any one point of time. Uh, and so <clears throat> I looked into the question of what you know, my friend Professor Hamada said, could you not turn uh, the spaghetti into lasagna? And so <laughs> I said, I, I know nothing about cooking, but I do know <laughs> that you, you need f flat pasta to make <laughs> lasagna. You can't make it from spaghetti. And you certainly can't go from lasagna into a pizza, meaning the final, you know, multilateral free trade coming out of this process. So it's very difficult, and you're going to carve up the world <clears throat> into a variety of things. So sometimes it may be better to do nothing rather than to do something mm. which is actually going to be problematic and counterproductive. So mm. I think we Americans haven't thought through this sufficiently because we've just said, well, Amer Europeans are doing it, and two, which right. is how it started, and two, if we can't move Doha or Uruguay around, let's just go down this route. And I think we, we just haven't, I mean, we need to sit back and look at it, and I think increasingly people are raising questions. Like <coughs> last, uh, last week, I think, The Economist had a lead editorial mm -hmm. uh, yeah. saying this is not the way to go, uh, but it's basically it's this great desire we have Naturally, because we are impatient. I yes. mean, that, that's our strength and our weakness. Yes. If something isn't moving, we want to start down another route and so on. And sometimes it's best probably just to sit down, you know, Confucian style and contemplate the world and, and do nothing until something really clears up where we do something really worthwhile. So that, those are the kinds of doubts which some of us mm. have. Well, um, why don't we see uh, what's on all of your mind. Um, we're now kind of open for questions. Uh, Jake will pick around the microphone. Uh, hi, it's, uh, it's Mark McCarthy from Georgetown University. I, I have a very um, 
simple question. Um, to give you a chance to talk about your views on the connection between um, job creation and trade in the context of, of the current economic crisis. Uh, we all know the numbers. U.S. Un uh, unemployment is at 9.7 percent. Uh, things are getting better. We only lost 270,000 jobs last month. Right. That's still better than the month before. But everyone expects this to continue to, to be a, a problem uh, through next year and maybe for years after that. Uh, so w what happens? Does, does as the, the green shoots continue, uh, economic recovery begins? Is there more trade? Is there less trade? What effect does this have on, on job growth here in the United States? What, how, how do you see things developing over the next couple of years? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a very good question. Um, of course, I mean, what we were discussing were more longer run arrangements where we can retreat into our <laughs> greater certitude, I think, at least. But I think the question you're raising speaks to the 1930s experience, like at the St. Petersburg Forum. Uh, Carlo Gossen, who runs what Nissan, was saying, it's a terrible situation. We are a viable industry. We ought to be allowed to um, have our protection uh, in the markets in which we are. And the problem is that if he's going to use protection, others are going to use it too. And this is the 1930s lesson that, OK, I can increase through Buy America some specific employment, though I doubt even that because there are user industries also which are involved uh, where you could lose um, a fair amount of employment as well. But let's, let's grant that Buy America is good, but what does that lead to? That means we have two months later we had Buy China, right? Uh, which is virtually retaliation. Um, it would spread. And when it spreads, it's doubtful as to who's actually better off. And, uh, you're not really going to create jobs that way, in my judgment, you know, going down that route. So I don't think uh, this is the way to go uh, when you have a world recession. The answer is, of course, what you know, Larry Summers and Bernanke and all these people have been doing, which is to add to the stim, which is to create the stimulus. And this is Keynes was the person who actually you may remember who broke ranks during after the uh, Great Depression and said the tariffs were good because they would divert a given inadequate world demand to your own goods. But then it turned out, I mean, you know, as John Robinson and others pointed out, the others can play the same game. So if I beggar my neighbor, my neighbor can beggar me. Now, I may be a little bit ahead, but the point is everybody is being beggared more or less, heuristically speaking. And it's more sensible, a better policy is to co is to just add to the world demand. Now, of course, you could say that the problem is that people are not willing to spend money as much as we are, but we haven't spent very much either yet. And we're you know, way behind our total st uh, stimulus package. I don't know why we are talking of a second one. We should talk in terms of completing the first one. Yes. <laughs> that would sound a lot better politically. So I think that's, that's my... Um, basic take on this. And I would just say also that internally also we do know uh, that we can lose a number of jobs in a, com in a competitive world economy. Like you, when the steel uh, safeguards were used mm. by President Bush in the you know, first year of his term, of, of his first term, uh, that led to higher costs for a number of users like cars and autos and so on. So, that in turn affects their competitiveness. So in, a, in an interdependent world economy, uh, your export potential also gets severely handicapped. So something, uh, and, and typically in, in economics we find, uh, I mean I had a friend, Ian Little at, at Oxford and he went to uh, advise the UK government you know, decades ago on the price of energy and so I asked him you know, what was the effect of it uh, on the government, uh, and he said, oh, they appointed a PR officer to, to deal with my report. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I said, what was your experience? So he said, I'd always believed that we were, the economists had overly simplified models. Uh, this was a reaction to Milton Friedman and people mm -hmm. like that. And so 
He said, I found that people in the government had even more simplified models, uh, totally overly simplified models. X affects Y, but that Y can affect Z, and Z in turn can affect X was simply kind of, you know, they just didn't do that. Uh, and so I, I think in this game, uh, the, the one chief lesson I can point to, I mean, you know, it's not a complete answer to what you asked for, uh, is that we don't want to go down the route that we, we did traverse once. And we already see the effects of retaliation and so on gradually coming up. So I, I think let's not, I mean, it, you're not going to really help the employment creation, though it sounds like you are, uh, because one country, if we were the only ones playing that game, yes, I would say yes, we can do that. But as soon as you admit a more complex world, it's not going to work. I, I, I mean, it's not going to work a fraction as well as we would like it to. Well, so I, I'm, I'm not a Keynesian in that. But Keynes also changed his mind, but he was always changing his mind. <laughs> well, Keynes said, uh, when the facts change, I change. <coughs> That's um, right. And um, uh, I have to note that the um, steel quotas, which, which, which yeah. President Bush uh, in, uh, put in place um, and which had the adverse effects which you described, uh, was explicitly rejected by President Clinton. Um, That's and true. And we that were besieged with demands for it. Um, and instead, um, we agreed to issue the trade-related jobs data earlier which happened to fall to me oh. um, in the Commerce Department, which so why I was so intimately connected, uh, related to that issue. Um, I do think, um, uh, I, I certainly agree as a macroeconomist with my friend here, but with respect to the importance of demand, but we also have to recognize that the relationship between growth and aggregate demand and job creation in the United States has changed. Um, that the relationships which held for about 40 years began to change a little in the 90s, but very drastically in this last cycle sure. um, when we created jobs relative to the growth in demand, to how strong the economy was at about half the rate that we had, that we did in the 1990s or the 1980s. Uh, that's why we only created 6 million jobs before we began to lose jobs in this cycle as opposed to uh, 20 million jobs in a longer cycle, albeit, um, in the 90s and 14 million jobs in the 1980s cycle. Um, so th this is a large, very deep structural problem that we're only beginning to understand. Um, and we see it also in wages, um, as you would expect. Um, the impact on jobs is also an impact on wages. And um, uh, and it certainly enormously complicates the uh, project of protecting the global trading system, the freedom of the global trading system. Because people always externalize it yes. too. Yes. And, yes. And, and it's not entirely unreasonable. As I said, in economics, we do have models which <laughs> which provide some sort of basis for it. This is just a it's hard to connect them with, with actually what's going on in a plausible way, even if you're open-minded. Um, Bob Kramer with uh, the Institute of Computer Technology, Computing Technology Industry Association. Um, you mentioned earlier that, that you thought that one of the solutions to the Doha round was that we should just take what we have and, and uh, call it a day. Um, largely, I, I assume that you mean the, the, the trade-offs between NAMA and agriculture and lease services, and services uh, what they yeah. said are now. Uh, this would be well and good, I think, except for the fact that most of the, the uh, uh, advanced economies like the United States services constitute about 85% or, or higher percentage of, of both um, uh, the economy, GDP, as well as uh, employment. And after the, the recession dissipates, uh, the growth, prime growth areas are probably going to be in services again. They already are in, in certain areas like agree. You know, health and, and education, et cetera, and IT, et cetera. Um, so the question I have is, is, is it, do you think that perhaps there may be some room for, for uh, services-specific negotiations in, in trade? Um, trade and services have expanded somewhat 
uh, in fact, has expanded significantly in the last couple of years uh, due to, to uh, advances in telecommunications and the internet, sure. et cetera. Do you think that there might be room for some services specific negotiations, say along with uh, Senator Baucus's suggestion about um, uh, trilateral negotiations between Japan, the United States, and the EU, um, or some similar kinds of services specific negotiations? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, th that is part of the sectoral negotiations which which we Americans want, actually, and including in some manufacturing sectors. So, but that is something which, which I think makes sense, but <clears throat> with not to, if, you, if we start doing that as part of this round, it's not going to work. So if the Senator Borkus wants it outside uh, on a parallel track, like for some years I've been arguing that India and US could actually arrive at a reasonable uh, bilateral relationship on this because Indians are into outsourced, you know, uh, 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 profiting like hell uh, from being a <clears throat> from the outsourcing business. Mm -hmm. uh, in exchange for that, they could open up more freely uh, to American banks and insurance companies and so on and so forth. Uh, after this last two years, I'm not so sure it will be that easy. <laughs> but still, the point is there is a possibility of trade-offs there, right? between two major players. Uh, I mean, one of the things I've been writing about, which, do, which would not work right now, because uh, right now the current situation being what it is, is international <clears throat> transactions in medical services uh, and healthcare. Uh, I mean, nobody's willing to touch that idea at all today uh, in the, among the advisors to the president. But the two things we worry about, costs, and we worry about availability of doctors. Um, the medic, the Massachusetts, in Massachusetts, you've not you've been able to bring in more people under the Mitt Romney, basically Democratic plan for in expanding coverage. But there's shortage of doctors. You can have an insurance policy, but you don't have doctors who will take you. Uh, and that's true. Of uh, I, I heard a senator from Alaska or somewhere also is mentioning that it was like giving people a a meal ticket, you know, or, or a voucher to go to a restaurant. There are no restaurants in the town. So what's the use of it? And similarly, the cost, of course, is a very big issue. I mean, I've, uh, when you look at it, something like close to $100 billion worth of costs could be saved a year from all kinds of outsourcing of, um, you know, med what we call medical tourism and stuff like that and so on. And you can bring in doctors. LBJ did that. Uh, during the Great Society program. He didn't bring in new doctors, but the for exchange visitors who had mm -hmm. to go back, provided they went to Appalachia, et cetera, were allowed to stay on for another five years or so. Mm -hmm. So LBJ was willing to do that, but today we can't even think about it. Uh, but the point is, uh, this is a case where maybe the doctors, in, not the insurers, insurers have nothing to, um, they're, they're perfectly happy as long as they collect the money. Uh, but the doctors probably fear the competition and actually pr probably foolishly because they also would benefit by like, like Harvard, maybe even Georgetown sets up facilities in Dubai, you know, and educational facilities, medical facilities, because they can rake in huge sums of money that way. So it's not, not a slam dunk that they will suffer from expanding this, but nobody will touch that. And that's and assuming that doctors get a little hit, uh, we are helping people at the bottom of the ladder, right? Because we're insuring most of the people who are uninsured and those who can't afford it rather than those who would, don't want it. So I think it's also a distributional issue. So we could do mm -hmm. things like that. Today it's impossible right now. But these are the kinds of things where, I mean, Indians who would profit from this in a big way, uh, from not just medical, but IT and all sorts of things. And we can profit because we've got, at least we'll have better banks than by that time and insurance companies to be able to exploit this. So I think there are possibilities. And I think this is something worth, I've been pushing for a special deal on that, which is a pure bilateral, but can be multiplied to other, other, uh, other mm. countries. And that could form the basis for eventually putting it into the, in, into the gaps in, in the WTO. Right. So, you know, it would, could be a nice way to escalate it in. So I, I agree with you. Uh, I think we have time for one more, one more question. 
Um, uh, Sam Bleacher, um, independent consultant these days. Uh, there are provisions in the climate bill that uh, would uh, provide for offsets under WTO GATT arrangements for countries that do not uh, control their uh, right. carbon emissions. <coughs> and I just wonder, I guess there are a couple of questions one might ask. One is whether you think they're legal in light of the special environmental and other kinds of uh, natural resources protections exemptions in, in WTO. And the other is whether you think they will even matter as they're written. I don't know if you're pretty familiar with the details of the provision, I'm sure Bob is, uh, and uh, whether they will even, uh, whether they're even broad enough to, uh, to make any difference. The, <clears throat> the WTO legality is a, is a complicated issue like all legal matters. Uh, I, I think <clears throat> I'm of the view having examined it myself because I also teach in the law school with a, with a lawyer who, who, who knows about these things. So I've been extended discussions and then Steve Chanowitz, et cetera, here have been looking into it. I think the legal opinion is divided, but what, what, what I'm convinced about is <clears throat> that if we use the cap and trade mechanism and if we don't have a 100% auction, if we give even a fraction of it for free to Robert, to you, to me, different firms, different industries, uh, different fractions, unless it's an identical fraction, you are necessarily having a differential cash subsidy in relation to the market premium. If it's a differential subsidy, unfortunately, there is a SCM, Subsidies and Countervailing Measures Agreement of 95 again, like the GPA, uh, and it would immediately be an actionable subsidy. Now, so the Europeans have been using cap and trade, but nobody bothered about it because they weren't threatening carbon tariffs against other people if they weren't doing something which the Europeans didn't like. So that's one problem, and I think we would be just thrown out of court immediately on that until we get to the, to the great idea of the president, which is that everything will be auctioned off. I don't know if it'll ever happen. Uh, in the U.S. system. But the second problem is, suppose we play that game, all right, and already it's created massive resentment elsewhere, you know, the, the bill, the WM, because that is the old-fashioned attitude, uh, namely, you do what we are doing or we hit you, right? Now, when the Europeans were threatening the same kind of thing against us, you remember the developing uh, the, the French Prime Minister's plan to hit us with with tariffs because we hadn't signed Kyoto. That time you should have seen what what the Americans and the Australians said about the French. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so it's ironic <laughs> that we are now contemplating the same sort of thing against others. But but just think of it a little bit long. We have the lowest fuel tax in the world on, on, on our gasoline, right, which at the pump. Almost every other country except in the Middle East uh, has about three or four times that much tax. It could easily be called a, called a carbon tax. And then there could be cases against us for having too low, mm -hmm. right? So do we want to go down? I, I think the president was absolutely right in whether he his lawyers were good or bad, I don't know, in saying this was WTO illegal. And I, th I think he just tried to stop it. Right. Because I don't think politically, economically, it's a good way to go. Uh, and this is, this is the old kind of Bush era tactic. You know, you, we were just going to use bluster and tell you, you've got to do this. Uh, it, it, that's the sort of thing which puts up people's backs. And, and countries like China and India, no, no law, they're not little countries. And so I don't think it was wise. So the legality issue, I think, I'm, I'm, in two weeks, if you write to me, I'll, I'll have a slightly better answer. But right now, it, it, the opinion is divided on whether it's, but, but the cap and trade is certainly actionable, meaning virtually illegal. Well, as many of you may know, <laughs> I'm a critic of cap and trade and a supporter of carbon taxes. Ah. 
um, That's uh, good. for climate change. But um, the um, but it is a very interesting climate is a is a very interesting issue with respect to trade in two respects. One is that it opens up a new area of really global trade. Um, and I believe that is the export of more energy efficient technologies and sure. alternative fuels. I think it will, will fuel the globalization process. No pun think, intended. Right, no, no <laughs> pun intended. Because I believe that the only way that we will be able to enlist the cooperation and, and full participation of China um, and India, but particularly China, is through uh, joint ventures in the development and sale of these technologies um, to make it as much in her interest as it is in ours, in our trading interest, again. Um, right, right. And um, I think that, uh, so I think climate um, is likely to be a real driver of global, over the long term, of both trade and, glo and the globalization process. Um, at the same time, the, this, the issue of leakage, as they say, which is to say a shift of jobs to countries <coughs> with lower carbon, uh, lower uh, price on carbon, whether through cap and trade or regulation or carbon tax, um, even though I think the, it would be very hard to show that that was what was happening, uh, and I would be doubtful that very much of it would happen, um, I just don't think it's a large are, enough factor. And there are many studies which show it's not likely right. to happen. But it will be, it is a very um, political, easily understood uh, story, narrative, right. um, for people to... Um, uh, that people will listen to because it goes to a pre-existing anxiety, which is they're going to lose their job. Right. Um, which good. is an anxiety everybody has. That's a good point. In this, in this <coughs> era. And so we're going to have to figure out a way to address that politically um, in a way that uh, protects both the trading system and, and the macroeconomics of this. And relieves the anxiety. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, we have gone over our time, but you have been a, a very attentive uh, um, collaborators of this. I could call you an audience, and um, I want to thank again. Thank you, uh, my good friend Jagdish Banja. Thank you, and um, I'll just close with um, reminding you that this is part of an NDN series um, of conversations on the great economic and political economic issues of our time. Uh, and we hope you'll, we'll see you again and you'll continue to support it. Thank you. <laughs>